my topic today is an introduction to Ayn Rand's ideas. And to do that, I want to be aware of something that I learned from Ayn Rand. And that is always, when doing a talk or doing an article, to be aware of your audience's context. Who are you speaking to? What do they know? What do they don't know? How many of you have read Ayn Rand's Fountainhead? Nearly everybody. Atlas Shrugged? Nearly everybody. OK, Ayn Rand's nonfiction. Many people, OK. I, um, thank you for that. Uh, I, I thought, you know, how could I approach Ayn Rand's ideas in a forum such as this? And, and I thought to do it this way here, to relate to what I thought when I first read Ayn Rand's works in the mid-1980s, a couple of years before this 1987 conference. And I read The Fountainhead first. It was at a recommendation of a friend of mine, and, and we were in a jazz band together. He was a jazz guitarist, and he said, you've got to read this book. And I read this book, and it hit, it hit me like a thunderbolt. And, and the, what hit me like a thunderbolt was the identification I felt with some of the characters. Now, I was, in, I was a businessman at the time, and I was in the commercial construction industry. So I went to many, many construction sites and, and large-scale construction sites over 18 years. And I was working at the time in high-rise buildings, skyscraper construction in downtown Hartford, working on 40-story buildings. And part of the identification that I had was to realize many of the things she was talking about, I saw directly in the people who were working on these sites. Now, I do not mean by this that they were objectivists or that they were consistent in what they did or that they were philosophical or that they had any interest in ideas at all. What I meant was that in the work they were doing, which was the contact I had with them, there was a strong identification, a strong parallel, a strong connection with Ayn Rand's Fountainhead. Ayn Rand's clarity in the novel appeared in, in what I saw and what, what these construction workers were doing. The certain emotional jubilation of, of work. And let's remember that objectivism is a philosophy of elation. It is a philosophy of, being, of, of achieving happiness and achieving a radiant sense of life. And of course, I wanted to tell everyone about it. And I did. I ruined many people's lunches by sitting down and talking, you have to read this book, you have to read this book. You know, and, and, uh, and, and, and I was challenged. And, and the character that I, since most of you have read The Fountainhead, I'm not going to do any plot spoilers for anyone who has not, but the character that I most identified with was actually not Howard Rourke, although he is absolutely extraordinary and unique and the driving force of the book. It was the character of Mike Dunnigan, the electrician, who was a minor character in the sense of driving the plot, but a major character in the sense that he was one of Rourke's few uh, close personal friends. Mike Dunnigan worshipped human ability. It was all he cared about. Worshipped human ability. And I saw Mike Dunnigan everywhere on construction sites. I want to stress to you, not in the sense that the people there were philosophical or that they would agree with Mike Dunnigan or agree with Howard Rourke or agree with Ayn Rand or even understand Ayn Rand. I meant in their approach to their work. All that mattered to them was whether you did a good job. I'm, I'm talking about at work. All that mattered was whether you did a good job. If you were an electrician on the site, did you run the piping properly? Did you install the wires properly? Is it according to plans and specifications? There was no faking reality. If you install the piping improperly, didn't do what the plans and specifications called for, your work was shoddy, improper, had to be redone, you cost people money, and you face the anger of the people on the job site, as well as financial retribution if you cost one of the contractors money. And so I realized that, that, this, that this was the driving principle by which I dealt with these people. It was competence on the job site. This competence had a very strong, obsessive reality focus. It didn't matter whether you wished a smaller pipe would work. If it's not going to work, it is not going to work, and your wishes don't matter, do they? And I realized that this obsessive focus um, on competence, focus on reality, 
meant that they, these were required, required, these workers, to be very smart and intelligent about their jobs. One of my connections to the electrical trade when I, when I moved to Providence, Rhode Island, was that I was an instructor for the electrical union. I was not a, I was not a, a member of the electrical union. I was not a, not, a, not a union member, but they hired me to come in every Monday night for some months to instruct the union electricians on how to install and wire digital fire systems and digital sound systems. And, uh, and these people were very smart, uh, very smart at their jobs. They were on the cutting edge in certain sense of installing digital technology. Uh, they had to learn some very sophisticated uh, things about cabling. And, uh, and it was a constant striving for them to learn more. I did this electrical instruction for several years and I would see the same people coming back. A constant process of education. And so in their work, in their work, there was this understanding that the only way they could do what was necessary in reality to accomplish the job that was at hand was to be educated. I also realized that in doing this, they were obsessed, as it were, with honesty in the fullest sense of the word. Now, I don't mean that, 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 that none of them ever lied or none of them ever created, did a moral breach. I mean on the job, in their work, you could not fake the facts of reality. They had to be honest at what they did. They had to be honest. They had to be independent in their judgments. Even though they're following plans and specifications, they cannot build the building necessarily the way they want. They have to build it the way the plans and specifications call for. They have to be independent in their judgments about what it takes to do that. And that this uh, knowledge that they had and their ability to do a good job and the actual good job that they did was a sense of enormous pride to them. They, no doubt about it, they were proud about what they did. I noticed that in their work on the job sites, if there was frustration or anger or problems, it usually came from the management. It usually came from some problem with the, with the plans and specifications of the building or some contrary direction that they got from the managers of, construction, of the construction or some contradictions that they gave and that these workers would be very angry if that happened. And I also noticed that if they were demoralized on the job site, if morale fell apart and they became unhappy in what they were doing and even developed an attitude of, I don't care, I'm just here for the day to do, it was because they were given contradictory orders which they could not follow. The kind of thing where, you know, the, the plans and specifications say do this, but do this also and this and this contradict. You can't do both. You can do one or the other. And when they face those kinds of contradictions, uh, which they could not resolve, this undercut their pride, made it impossible for them to do a good job, and, uh, and that there was a certain uh, 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 connection between bad decisions which would lead to contradictions which are impossible to implement in reality, which would undercut their moral sense and, and lead to bad morale. And this was, this was a source, and, and when it happened, when it, and it did happen at times, that there would be demoralization on the job site, this was very often the source of it. So I realized that morally, these people, in their work, and I don't know anything about their private lives, in their work, were reality-centered, focused on uh, the need to learn more about what they were doing, were morally proud of what they were doing, and that this was based on a certain sense of honesty and allegiance to the facts. And I also noticed something else. I noticed that the viability of their industry, and it was the amount of work that was going on, the amount of work that was available, the amount of buildings that were being built, the speed with which they can't, could be built, whether or not a project that a builder wanted to build was allowed to go ahead and actually become a building, depended upon a certain political context. If the project was tied up by someone in government who demanded a redesign, or wanted the builders to make some kind of contributions or to hire a certain number. There, there were wage laws that were trying to be passed to pay certain amounts or to hire to promise jobs to a certain number of people. In other words, when, when, uh, the, when the government intervened this way, this was the biggest source of undercutting the economy in the area and that the people I knew on the construction site were aware in some sense of those problems and knew 
basically, that bad decisions by the government could undercut and hurt them. Their self-interest, in other words, could be exercised only in a certain political context. There's a political basis to this. And I stress to you, I'm, I don't know anything about the politics of these people. I don't know whether they liked, you know, Democratic leftists or whether they liked Republican conservatives or whether they didn't have any views at all or whether they voted the way their fathers did, I don't know. What I know is that on the job, their job depended upon a certain context of law and a certain laissez-faire context among the government. And when the government began to intervene, this undercut the, the capacity to build buildings, and this was one of the major sources of, uh, of uh, economic dislocation and their, uh, uh, and, and their inability to go ahead with their jobs and their careers. I saw all this and I kind of got it in a non-reflective way. I saw all these parallels and, and I was really, and I stress, I was really taken, I still am taken by Mike Dunnigan, the electrician. All he cared about was human ability. And all he cared about was whether you did a good job or not. And that is the essence of what I saw in the construction industry. All that mattered was whether you did a good job. Beyond that, we could fight about all kinds of things. But we didn't fight about that. Either you did a good job or you didn't. So I went ahead with my reading and I read Atlas Shrugged. And in Atlas Shrugged, I was taken in an overwhelming sense with the figure of Hank Reardon. I think that in a certain sense, Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged can be read as the education of Hank Reardon. Hank Reardon, the industrialist, the man of superlative ability, far more, far more industrial ability, far more business ability, and far more ability at, at, the fact, at, at understanding the metallurgical facts of reality and deal with them in an industrial way and, and having practical results than I could ever hope to be. I would be one of those people who, if I worked for Hank Reardon or one of his suppliers, would, you know, would create myself the amount of labor of a medieval blacksmith and the rest is a gift from Hank Reardon. And I saw Hank Reardon's position and I saw him struggling to try and understand the world around him and to understand why it seemed like all of his greatest virtues were the subject of attack. And I began to understand more deeply, especially when I read Galt's speech to the world, the, the actual meaning of some of the things I'd identified in the fountainhead. So I thought to take this as an introduction to Ayn Rand's ideas um, in order to think about the structure of those ideas and how the actual formal philosophical system and the ideas that Ayn Rand brings forth actually follow the pattern I've just given you. And that it is, it is by Awareness, loyalty to reality, that one is self-empowered. That I, personally, individually, could be something more than I was. Could become a better person and a more accomplished person by awareness of this, that prosperity and happiness could be mine. And let's just say that my personal situation at the time was one in which I was not happy and was not actually doing anything to make myself happy. And when I, when I became aware of that, it was an enormous sense of self-empowerment, of, of, uh, of being able to achieve that. And it was when I read Ayn Rand's nonfiction that I began to see the philosophical reasons for this. So let's think about those reasons for a second. Ayn Rand said there are five main branches of philosophy. What's the first and most fundamental? First and most fundamental branch of philosophy. Metaphysics. It's metaphysics, the basic nature of the world as is. Now, the objectivist metaphysics is very, very short. Ayn Rand said that she would be suspicious of a, philosoph of a philosopher or a philosophical system that had a big, long book on metaphysics. Something's wrong with that because metaphysics really says, look, see all this? There it is. Existence exists. And, and think about where I started in thinking about those construction workers. What is it that they were obsessed with? That they're in a world that is solid. They're in a world that's real. The buildings that they build are not built out of molasses. That suddenly they begin to become something that they're not. The buildings are what they are. If they're built uh, 
with the wrong structural materials or the, or the materials are assembled in the wrong way, the building collapses or doesn't fulfill its function. If the electrician is pulling the piping and the wiring and he is not cognizant of the facts of reality that things are what they are, then his system fails, the piping gets ripped out, the wiring gets replaced, and it costs somebody a lot of money. Things, are, things exist. Existence exists in Ayn Rand's philosophical formulation. Existence is the sum total of existence here. Existence, things which exist. And existence is all of them. Existence exists. And the existence is the identity of the thing. What is a piece of pipe to an electrician? How would you say what a piece of pipe is? And the answer is it is a piece of is a metal tube. It is two inches or one inch in diameter or whatever size that it is. It has a certain structure. It has a certain material identity. It is a certain size. It will withstand the elements in a certain way. Certain kinds of piping can be used for certain things and in certain environments and certain in others. In some places we need plastic piping because metal will rust. In other places we need metal piping because plastic is not strong enough. Things are what they are. Existence exists and existence is identity. It would be ridiculous to say, oh, the piece of pipe is. But by the way, the identity of the pipe is something else. It doesn't matter. See, to split existence from identity, notice Ayn Rand's formulation. Existence is identity. Not existence has identity. Existence is identity. And I realize that this is what the people on this construction site, were, without ever hearing this formulation, what they were doing. This is, what, this, is, this is a principle that they accepted. Things exist, they are what they are, their existence is their identity. And I also observed that their understanding was such that they needed to keep growing their knowledge of understanding that they were conscious beings. This is implicit, they, did, they didn't study consciousness. They were conscious beings and every person had to understand his job using his own eyes, using his own mind, eyes and senses as the, as the source of information, conceptual understanding in order to form, to grasp what, should, what it is and what should be done about it. And so th these, these, these people on the construction site, I'll, I'll say men, but men and women on the construction site were following this principle of epistemology. Consciousness is conscious. And it can't, can't be reduced. Never heard anybody on the construction site saying, you know, uh, I'll, be, I'll, I'll be the one who's aware of reality for you. Even if they said, do it my way, as the architect Howard Rourke said to the electrician in the fountainhead, right, the part where he's cutting through the beam, a very, uh, you know, a scene uh, in which, which uh, Rourke says, do it this way. It still depends upon Mike Dunnigan grasping what it is that Rourke wants him to do. And Mike loves, I think is the right word, uh, Howard Rourke because of this focus and because of this demand that things be done the right way. She realized that, that, that the principles of metaphysics and epistemology are coming right out of the observations that I had on these job sites. And that these met, followed these principles implicitly without understanding them. It was always implicit and understood that every individual had free will. Every one of us could make a choice. Get your act together or you're off the job. Right? Implies that you have the capacity to make the choices, to take the actions necessary, to learn what is needed, to, uh, and to direct yourself by your own free will. Wouldn't make any sense to say get your act together or you're off the job site if you have no capacity to get your act together. If people didn't have free will and you found somebody doing something wrong, you'd have to just fire them and get somebody who somehow automatically knew what to do. But that's not how human beings work. That's not what we are. We are beings of volitional consciousness. And so the demand on the job site that people do that they understand their crafts, that they understand their jobs, and that they perform, as is not even to the best of their ability, but as required by the job. Because if the best, if the best of your ability is not good enough, that's not going to help the building stand up. Correspond to re uh, awareness of reality, allegiance to reality, 
by your free will, your volitional consciousness. And that all of this was, was implicit in what I saw on the job site. You see how what's coming out of this is a certain philosophical view. I, I could not have done this without Ayn Rand. It's Ayn Rand that made these identifications. But as I, who in reading the work, was able to connect it back to my own experiences and to see how connected to reality this was. When I understood and still work to understand Ayn Rand's theory of concept formation, the technical theory of concept formation in the introduction to objectivist epistemology, you realize that that, uh, that focus on reality is absolutely central to the way abstract ideas are formed. And that's really, no, really the same process as the electrician who's aware of reality and puts the piping that's needed. That the, that the abstract concepts we have are not supernatural revelations, Ayn Rand said, and nor are they just the subjective whims that we all agree on. This is the alternative that we often hear in contemporary thought. Some people are generally associated with the left or the subjectivists will say, oh, there's, there's no content to abstract ideas. There are things that people agree on. One man's justice is another man's injustice. One man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. Right? All these things are just conventions that we understand. There's no beauty, per se. There's only our subjective whim as to what beauty is. Whim, causeless desire that I don't care to understand. Right? And then the other side answers that says, no, we actually, these concepts are something. They exist at a higher plane of existence. We apprehend them somehow, but not through our senses, by closing our eyes and just thinking about them. And Ayn Rand says no to all of this. No, all of this. Abstract understanding comes from a proper awareness of reality. And I realize that her concept, that her process of, her, her uh, solution to the problem of concept formation is directly connected to the things I saw on the construction site. You get, you get the idea now as to why I come to the conclusion that she is right about these things. Not because her system fits together in a nice way, but because every step of her system as a correspondent in reality, and I'm able to validate it. And uh, this leads to a certain implicit sense of ethics among these construction workers. Ethics has to deal with three main questions. Ethics or morality, use the terms in, in, uh, to mean the same thing here. Three main questions. First off, what goals should we pursue? What goals should we pursue? What are we after? What do we want? What is it that we're trying to achieve? The second question is, anybody? By what means should we achieve them? By what means should we achieve them? What is it that we're after? How should we achieve them? And the third would be, and who should benefit from our actions? Who should benefit from our actions? Now, the moral obligation? Sorry? What about moral obligation? Come back to that in a second. One, one answer to this problem is that the aims and ends to which we go are not perceived by means of our senses and established by our senses, but are given to us by some supernatural revelation. If that is the case, that these are the ends that we should be after, then we should develop the means necessary to attain those ends. And if that is the case, then, who should be the beneficiary of those actions? And the answer would be someone outside of us, whoever it is, is the, is the, is the focus of those revelations. Moral obligation, then, would be understood in the sense of what do these revelations say? If the revelations say, for example, that one should be worshipful of God and that that's the number one 
goal that we should be after, then we should develop a means to do that. And the fundamental uh, uh, beneficiary of that should be God or his representatives. But on the other hand, those who reject the supernatural view and go to the socially constructed view say, well, let's remember that these ends are not given to us in any divine way. They're actually just whims. We decide what they are. Socially constructed, one society decides one thing, another society decides another, one person decides another, one person decides another. Then the means to achieve them would be up to the society to construct or up to the individual whims. In which case, something like moral obligation would be determined according to the particular whims that the person or the society decides to put together. And what Ayn Rand says is that both sides of this are wrong. Where we determine the proper ends of an ethical action is that which is beneficial to life qua man's life. That which is proper to a rational being and proper to all rational beings. This, of course, you study this more deeply, leaves enormous room for options. But some things are not optional. Let's consider something very, very basic like food. We, have, we all have, I'm sure, enormous differences in taste in food. It certainly would be wrong to say there was one kind of food and one kind of taste that we should all accept, and it's a moral obligation to accept that, right? That would be, that would be pretty ridiculous. But it would also be ridiculous to say we can eat anything we want. Because if you try to eat sand, you will learn the consequences of your mistake very quickly. Some things are food and some things are not. And by that parallel, uh, we can think about things that are proper to the life of a rational being. What means should we use, Ayn Rand said, to achieve the ends proper to a rational being? And the answer is rationality. You use your rational consciousness to think about the ends that you want to achieve and what is the proper way to achieve them. To achieve, to attempt to achieve a rational end, let's say a free society, by an irrational means, let's say by establishing a dictatorship to force everyone to be free, would be a massive contradiction that could only end in destruction. The means to achieve then the ends proper to a rational being is to use one's rationality. And rationality, then, is Ayn Rand's primary virtue. The ends that we wish to achieve are values. Those are the things that we are trying, that we act to gain and or keep. The means by which we go to try to attain, the, the means by which we act, the actions we take to achieve those values are virtues. The primary virtue, says Ayn Rand, is your rational your use of your rational faculty. It is ration, rationality. Consequently, all of Ayn Rand's virtues, the seven virtues in Atlas Shrugged, are all species of rationality, which should be your attitude toward your own mind with respect to other people. And the answer is independence. You need to think about things in an independent way. It does not mean you can't learn from other people. I learn from other people all the time. But I only have learned something if I've considered it independently, which usually means alone with the door shut, thought about it carefully, and accepted it by the independent use of my mind. The use of rationality requires principles. Well, are you going to make your principles subject to the, to the whim of the day so that you change them minute by minute by minute? Uh, if so, you have no loyalty to principles, perhaps you don't understand the principles, or perhaps your principles are wrong or contradictory, but in which case, you do not have any integrity. Integrity is loyalty to rational principles, says Ayn Rand. Honesty is not primarily don't lie, but do not fake the facts of reality. Honesty means the refusal to fake the facts of reality as the workers on the construction site had to understand the plans and specifications by the independent use of their minds, they had to follow the principles of proper construction properly and not just violate them whenever they want. And they have to be honest about what the facts of reality are. What about dealing with other people? 
How would we apply rationality to dealing with other people? What is the virtue? What is the virtue of applying rationality to interactions with other people? The virtue is justice. The virtue is justice. It is by treating people as they deserve. Treating people as they deserve. In some cases it may mean I would like to be close personal friends with this person. I share values very deeply with this person. And um, another case it might mean I decide not to deal with this person at all. We're simply, uh, uh, it's impossible for us. We don't share any values. We don't share any means of communication. Um, uh, so I simply won't deal with him. Injustice in every case means rational evaluation of other people and treating them as they deserve. What about rationality as it applies to the physical world, to material values? What is the virtue? What is the virtue that, by which the master virtue, as it were, rationality, is used to apply to the facts to the facts of physical reality. And the virtue is productiveness. Productiveness. Shaping reality. Shaping physical matter in a form proper to our values. Creating a world in the shape of our values. And to do that, of course, we must follow studiously Francis Bacon's dictum, nature to be, nature to be commanded must be obeyed. In building the building, it is possible to build a 40-story building, 40 levels connected by elevators, which will stand for 100 years, only if we are loyal to the facts of reality and obey the facts of reality. Build the building as is required, and we shape this piece of ground and this matter in a form of human values by a process of productiveness and with the virtue of productiveness. All of Ayn Rand's virtues, then, are the application of rationality. What about one's awareness and understanding of one's own moral status, one's own self? What virtue should a person use to shape his own character, his own soul, if you'd like, in the image of rational values? What is the virtue? Self-esteem. Sorry? Self-esteem. Self-esteem is the value to be achieved. That's what you want to get. You want to achieve self-esteem. What is the means by which you're going to achieve self-esteem? In Ayn Rand's formulation, it is pride. It is by pride of self. And she, I, she defines pride as a virtue, the virtue of pride as moral ambitiousness. Moral ambitiousness. Simply two words. The ambition, the commitment to be a moral person. Doesn't mean a person who never makes mistakes. Moral people can make mistakes. It means a commitment and an ambition to maintain one's moral purity. Which would mean, in the context of a mistake, if you make a mistake, to recognize it, understand it, and to change. These are Ayn Rand's virtues, and I realize that all of these virtues on the job site were present in the context of the job, not talking about people's personal lives, because I very seldom met construction workers in their personal lives. I don't know what their personal lives are, and it's really irrelevant here. On the job site, they were rational. They were independent. They were honest. They were productive. They were proud. They were proud of what they did. And they approached their jobs with integrity. And this is, this is the, the briefest overview you could possibly do of Ayn Rand's, uh, Ayn Rand's virtues. All of this is based on an ethical system in which the concept of value is based on the concept of life. It's impossible for an inorganic entity to have any values. Rocks don't have any values. Human beings have values. Because human beings can see goals to be achieved, goals which they want to act to gain and or keep, and that the standard for pursuing those goals is that which is proper to the life of a rational being. 
What is the parallel in the business world to this? And the answer, I think, is profit. First and foremost, it's the survival of the corporation. Think about this financial crisis. I don't, don't want to digress on this, but what is it that the government has done with its interventions by saying some businesses are too big to fail? It is said to the executives, in effect, no matter what you do, your business will never go out of existence. And if you do that, therefore, the survival of the corporation and its profit becomes something that can be pushed aside in order to pursue other ends. And so even, I think we know that regulations that tell businessmen can't do this, can't do this, can't do that, are deeply problematic. In fact, they're wrong. I'll just say deeply problematic here. But even the subsidies, which tell businesses we will protect you, undercut, undercut the need of the business people to maintain the existence of the corporation to achieve profit. What about the means and virtues? Rationality as an ethical virtue has, I think, the component in the business world of rational persuasion. Rational persuasion. Presenting values to customers in the market. I noticed in my career in the construction industry many dishonest contractors. Not the majority by any means, but many, maybe I should say some, dishonest contractors. But I noticed that over the course of 18 years, it almost always caught up with them. In the end, this was not the way for them to, to, to commit fraud in the marketplace was not the way to achieve the long-range survival and profit of their businesses. And they failed. And I submitted this for the same reason that a person who tries to undercut his, to deny his own rationality, to act fraudulently with others in his personal life, ultimately will end up frustrated and as a failure. And I noticed that in the construction industry, I saw that repeatedly. The guys who did not fulfill their contracts on construction sites uh, were cut out of the bidding of the next project. Even though their price was cheaper, construction managers would know that in the end they'd have a big mess and it would cost them more money, and, and money, money means uh, job delays mean money, et cetera, and that they did not succeed. And I also noticed that implicitly in all of these construction workers and in all of these contractors and all of these businesses, who is the primary beneficiary? And the answer is themselves. Themselves. Every one of these construction workers tried to negotiate the best rate of pay he could get in exchange for his efforts. Every one of the contractors who hired them tried to get the best contract they could get on the site to make the most money. Uh, that the, that, the, that self-interest was clear in the economic sphere. What Ayn Rand observes is that it is far from limited to the economic sphere. Self-interest as an ethical principle cuts across the range of one's life. Let's consider uh, an objection that will often come up at this point. What about something like charity? What about something like charity? Is it wrong to donate to charity? Of course not. Nothing of what I've said or what I could read in Ayn Rand said it was ever wrong, said that it was wrong in principle to donate to charity. How would you determine what charities to donate to, however? Suppose you adopt it as a moral principle. I'm going to give through charity to all those who are less well off than I am, and I'm going to adopt that as a moral principle. Well, if it's a moral principle, it needs to be universal. You apply it at all times. What would you have to do? You'd have to give your money to everyone you saw who was less well off than you were and to everyone who asked you. When you got up in the morning, you turned on the television, you'd have to give to that charity. When you went to the store, you'd have to give to whoever's up in front. You'd have to give to this fund. You'd have to give to the children's fund on the way in, and you'd have to give to the children's fund on the way out. You'd have to give, as a moral principle, you would have to give away all of your wealth if you adopted it as a moral principle. Now, what I think happens is that most people don't adopt it as a moral principle. What they do is they give selectively to charity. How do you determine which charity you should give to? What faculty do you use to determine that? Self well, self-interest would be the goal. Self-interest would be the moral principle. But what faculty in yourself would you use? Your rational faculty. 
Irrational faculty. I don't know, is that what you said? I don't. I, I said of values of what you're pursuing. But the question is, is giving to charity at a certain time a value or not? Is giving to this charity a value and is this giving to this charity a value? How would you determine whether it's a value or not and whether you have the means to do it and whether you should do it? And the answer is you have to think. You'd have to say to yourself, I'm not going to give to this charity today because I simply don't have the money. It would impoverish myself and my family. I don't see any reason to elevate them at the price of self-sacrifice. And I'm going to give to this charity. I'm not going to give to this charity. And the way you determine that is by your rational faculty. The primary virtue is rationality, see? The, the, the virtue which is universal, which you use at every step, is your rational faculty. And that is how you would determine whether I give to this charity or whether I give to this charity. It should be obvious that there are charities out there asking for money who um, are contradictory. Sure. If, I give to one, if I give to one, let me finish the thought, and then I'll be glad to, glad to exchange. If you give to one, you're actually undercutting the purpose of the other. How would you determine this? You would have to determine which, which charities match my values, which charities are the ones that I should give to? And in fact, which ones do I have the means to give to? There are certain times in a person's life, I think, when a person should not give to charity. And there are other times in a person's life when a person should give to charity. And by giving here, we have to take the very broad sense of the word. It's not just money, but can also be time. I had a student in a class one day who was failing his Western Civilization class. And so I said to him, spring break is next week, what are you doing? And he said, I'm going with some charity, traveling several thousand miles, to build homes for people who need the homes. And I said, OK, is that your value? You want to do that? Yes, it is. OK, it's your value. I'm not saying that there's wrong with it, but I will observe this. What are you going to do when you come back and you fail the class? Perhaps you should think about this. Perhaps you shouldn't go off and build the house now. Perhaps you should stay here and learn your studies. And there's a time to do this in the future. How would you understand that? You'd understand it by thinking about it. Right? So the primary virtue is rationality, and you could not universalize charity as a, moral, as a moral principle, because you would have to give to every charity available, which means you would have to progressively, progressively uh, strip yourself of your resources in order to be a moral person. OK, objection. Go ahead, please. What about the emotional factor? I may feel a more, a greater empathy towards this charity than over this other. Oh, sure, sure. What about, what about, what about the emotion? It's not rational. What about, well, it can, well, first off, uh, Ayn Rand rejects any idea that the emotional is in conflict with the rational. Well, she denies that, but she doesn't prove it. What I would do, if I felt an empathy for a certain charity, and I said, I feel like I should give to this charity, I, first of all, I wouldn't deny that feeling. The feeling is real. I wouldn't deny that feeling. I would ask myself why I'm having that feeling. Why am I having that feeling? What is it that they're doing? That might lead me to support them in one way and not support them in another way. It might lead me to say I'd be better off not giving to them now so I could do something more for them in the future. Many, many, many options. Well, one would have to examine one's emotions, one's empathy for the charity, and ask yourself if it's appropriate at this time and whether one should follow that emotion. Ayn Rand, and I think she's absolutely right about this, rejected the idea that one should simply follow one's emotions as a guide to life. I'm sure that Hitler had great negative emotions toward the Jews. What did following them do? You, you, one cannot just follow one's emotions as guide to life. If that were the case, we would not need an ethics at all. The whole field of ethics would go away. We wouldn't have any need for it. We could simply say, Follow what your emotions say. But what happens when people's emotions conflict? What happens if a person has an emotion which, if followed, would actually destroy them? A heroin addict gets a great emotion of elation when he takes a shot of the drug. Does that mean that he should do it? Of course not. So one would have to examine one's, one, I suggest, one would have to examine one's emotions, not deny them by any means. Examine them, um, not condemn them, but understand them, and then ask what one should do about it. And um, 
It's, it's obvious, I think, on the face of it that people have different emotions toward the same thing. Dr. Peikoff in, in Objectivism, the Philosophy of Ayn Rand, has the example of an x-ray of a lung, and several different people see the x-ray, and they have very, very different emotions depending on who they are. The doctor sees it and feels great sadness because he recognizes the shadow. Someone else sees it, a student sees it, and feels great wonder at the technology involved. A savage sees it and feels a sense of incomprehensible fear because it's something he's not seen before. The scientist sees it and feels intrigued because there's a problem there to be solved. Right? Different people have different emotions based on, based on what they bring to their observation. Or I think about driving down the road and seeing a dead cat. It actually happened to me once. I was riding with a young woman, saw a dead cat, and I said, oh, the poor cat. And she said, oh, she said, it makes me feel great. Good riddance. I was mauled by a cat as a child. Right? She had a different emotion to the cat than I did. I don't condemn her for her emotion. She didn't condemn me for mine. We simply talked about them. Why would we have this emotion? I think that one can, one can and should, through the process of introspection, which is the examination of one's own processes, try to understand the emotions that one has and why does one have them. And, and, uh, and that that, and that, that would uh, allow one to face the empathy or the antipathy. There are lots of people who have a visceral, emotional hatred of everything attached to capitalism. I think they need to go back and rethink things. And, and uh, that's, that would be the application of that. In their work, these construction workers, these construction companies required freedom to act. This freedom is not just a social construct well, we'll have freedom here because we're free people. Other people may not be free. Nor is it something that is given to human beings by God. There has simply been too much unfreedom in the world to support that. In fact, 98% of people for 98% of history have been unfree. Freedom is a requirement of the rational mind. I said, I ran said, I, I repeated, that we are beings of volitional consciousness. We have free will by which we use our minds. We are free to think about things or not. We are free to examine our emotions or not. We are free to perceive reality and attempt to understand it honestly or not. What do you need to exercise your free will and your volitional consciousness? You need to be free of the coercions of other people. I can put a gun, somebody can put a gun to somebody else's head. The godfather puts a gun to somebody's head and says in one minute either your signature or your brains is going to be on that piece of paper. And he signs the contract. You could force somebody to take that action, but can he force them to actually agree with it? The mind does not work under coercion. And this ultimately is a deep re deeper reason why free market economics is the only system that has led to prosperity. Because we are beings of volitional consciousnesses, and we have to be free from the coercions of others. Not free from the dictates of reality, because I am not free to float like a soap bubble or to build a 42-story building out of, out of uh, chewing gum, but free to use my mind and to act in the pursuit of values. And limitations on that freedom are defined by the principles of individual rights, which is the bridge from the moral to the political, and the one overriding rule, of course, is never to initiate the use of force against others. It is one thing to say, I have a contract here. I'd like to urge you to sign it. These are the benefits that I will give to you, as, as, uh, as, as one economist once said. Capitalism says, do this for me, and I'll make you feel good. And socialism says, do this for me, or I'll make you feel bad. And uh, one must never abandon the persuasive use of reason to present values to others and turn to the initiation of force to try to require them to do it. I noticed that most of the construction workers on the job site were by and large opposed to welfare schemes if posed that way. Do you think we should be spending hundreds of billions of dollars in giving? No, they'd say absolutely not. Now then, at that point there, they broke down because most were in favor of some kind of social security, or they would exempt themselves and say, well, this doesn't apply to the subsidies for the union because that's protecting the workers. So they were very, very inconsistent. But overall, their jobs and their actions required freedom and was inimical 
to forced redistribution. And just my, my final word on this before, that there was a fifth branch of philosophy, which I've not mentioned. I mentioned metaphysics, what it, that, that it is, epistemology, understanding what it is, ethics, what should I do about it, now that I know that it is and what it is, and politics, how should we structure uh, and organize a government, right? What's the fifth branch? Aesthetics. Aesthetics. It's art. I think the architecture expert to remind us of that. It's aesthetics. And I noticed in, I noticed in the construction site that I never really talked about art with these folks, but, but when art came up, there was one thing that always came across repeatedly. They didn't like smears and they called it junk. So Ayn Rand's, Ayn Rand's theory leads to a support for representational art, art which is a selective recreation of reality, as our concepts to be valid should not be divorced from reality, so our depictions of reality should not be divorced from reality. 